There we go. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good, good. It's been a good week. Um, things have been going well uh, here at the church, and I, I'm just excited to see so many new faces. We, uh, I, I, we announced it a few weeks ago, but just like a couple weeks back, we did this newcomer gathering, inviting people to come that uh, have been coming to the church just in the past six months, and we had a, a just a great turnout of people here, and that's exciting to know that in the past six months, we've had so many new people join us that say, like, hey, we want to stick around and be a part of this community, and so um, it's just, it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be a part of this church right now. It, it feels like God is bringing us new people every day, and if you're one of those new people that's joining us for the first time, you're joining us right in the middle of our Love Is series. So for the past few weeks, we've been talking about what is love, and we've been doing this series because Jesus said that as his disciples, our lives should be marked by love. Jesus said the world will know that we're his followers by how we love other people, and the the threshold, right, the, the bar that we're supposed to reach is Jesus said we should love other people as he has loved them, and that's a pretty high bar. So it's important for us to be students of love, to learn how to love, and we want to be a church that's just known for being loving. So we've been studying for the past few weeks, uh, we've been studying about love, and we've been using 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 as our guide. So let's, let's go ahead and read it again, shall we? It says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. What a great verse. We've already spoken in this series about patience. Love is being patient and kind because love recognizes that true transformation takes time. And so we're patient with one another and loving. We've learned that love is not jealous or entitled. It it delights when good things happen to others, right? That's a loving response. We learned that love is not proud does not seek glory for itself, but seeks to honor others above itself. And it is not selfish, always demanding its own way, but defers to others, choosing what is best for everyone over what is best for self. And last week we spoke about honor and how love does not make others feel small. So this week we're moving on and we're going to shift our focus to the second half of verse 5 the be- and the beginning of verse 6. And we're going we're to kind of cover a couple different phrases this morning. We've been taking it kind of like one or two words at a time. We're going to cover a couple phrases this morning because I think there's a lot of things that go hand in hand with these phrases. And so we're looking at the beginning of verse 5 where it says, love is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. I actually love the passion translation of this verse. It says, love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Last week, we touched briefly on this tension that we find between honor and honesty. We talked a little bit about how sometimes being brutally honest is just unloving. And that when we seek to honor one another, sometimes we withhold our opinion (laughs) for the sake of the relationship. I mentioned that sometimes the most honoring thing that you can do is simply keeping your mouth shut. (laughs) But honesty also has a place in love. Heaven knows that we need friends in our lives that love us enough to tell us the truth, right? Towards the end of my time in undergrad uh, at, at Southwest Baptist University, I started dating this young lady that I met in the theater program there. She was really fun and energetic and But let's just say they had a lot to learn about when it came to loving other people well. I, too, was learning a lot about loving others, and one of the things I was learning was that relationships take work. I don't know if you guys knew this. (laughs) You've already learned something today. I I had this belief at the time that God had this one perfect person out there for me, and I was determined to find her. It's kind of like a needle in a haystack scenario, except for it was a needle in a stack of needles. And I kept getting pricked. (laughs) The the problem with that belief was that if there is this one perfect person drove me to kind of quit relationships the second that things got hard. If this is getting hard, then then this person is just not the one. You know, and I would move on. And and after a series of 
struggling relationships and failed relationships, when challenges arose, I just told myself that, yeah, she must not be the one, and moved on. And I was, I was just coming to grips with the fact that the common denominator in all my broken relationships was me when I met this young lady. And she was fun to hang out with, but seemed to kind of consistently be really self-focused. I, I was struggling not to give into my old habit of just bailing on relationships, but after um, helping her with the, her grieving for her f- grandfather's passing, I found myself in this weird spot where I just kind of felt trapped. Have you ever been there before? Felt like trapped in a relationship? And so to make it more complicated, she had already confessed feelings of depression and the fact that she struggled with suicidal thoughts in her teenage years. And so I found myself in this place of like, I, I don't want to break this girl's heart. Like, she's already struggling so hard. I wasn't happy in the relationship, but I I didn't want to hurt her. We'd had a few conversations about engagement, and I was becoming increasingly aware that it was time to fish or cut bait. (laughs) And I finally worked up the courage to end the relationship. I called her up, and I told her how I felt, and she didn't really take it all that well, but overall took it better than I feared that she would. With a newfound sense of freedom, I called up one of my friends to tell them to which he replied, oh, good, she was bad news, man. So that was such a toxic relationship. To which I said, really? Why didn't you say anything? Like, I, I was considering engagement with this girl, and, and you're seeing all this stuff from the outside. Like, why didn't you tell me? He says, well, I, I just didn't want to make you mad. Over the course of the next couple of weeks, I ended up having very similar conversations with several of my other friends who all had a very similar sen- a sentiment. All of which had expressed their concern, had none of which had expressed their concern to me personally, but they had all discussed it with each other. <laughs> Come to find out that they would actually often avoid me if they knew that she was around because of, they just really couldn't stand to be around her. Finding this all out after the fact, naturally you can imagine the frustration that I felt. But it, I, I think it's also important to understand my conviction on this matter. I believe that second only to the decision to follow Jesus, the decision about who you marry is one of the most important decisions you will ever make. No other decision will have greater impact on your life than who you choose to tie your destiny to. The young people that are in this place right now, take notes. <laughs> and at this point, I felt like I'd almost make one of the biggest mistakes of my life, and none of my friends had said a word. That summer was one of the hardest periods of my life. I asked myself a lot of hard questions that summer. What was it about me that made my friends afraid to tell me what they thought? It started kind of an obsession for me that lasted about 10 years. Um, Learning how to have deep relationships. How do you build a strong, meaningful, honest, life-giving relationship with someone else? Where you have people that are willing to sit in your blind spots and tell you the hard things in a way that doesn't just beat you up with it, but in a way that helps you better navigate some of the tough choices that you have to make in life. I've led teams and people through many different capacities and contexts, both domestically and internationally. What I have found is that the only thing that limits your ability to be completely open and honest in a relationship is your willingness to demonstrate that you care personally about the other person. I'll say that again. The only thing that limits your ability to be honest in a relationship is your willingness to demonstrate that you care personally. People need to know that you care before they'll care what you know. This is actually a quote from a gal named uh, Catherine Scott. Catherine Scott was a uh, well-known like, kind of tech executive working in Silicon Valley, and she wrote a book called Radical Candor, which is one of the dozens of books that I've read on this subject because, like I said, I had a 10-year obsession with how do you have honest relationships. And I, I highly recommend it to anyone, especially if you lead other people. Kim's, Kim's book was just fascinating to me. And in it, she outlined this uh, relationship between love and honesty beautifully. The way she described it was, was kind of like a grid, like a Cartesian grid with four quadrants. And in this grid, the vertical axis kind of represented how well you do it at the first dimension of relationship, which is caring personally for individuals. Caring personally, like actually demonstrating that you care personally. And then the second dimension, the horizontal dimension, the horizontal axis, was challenging directly. Do you challenge people? Are you honest with them? And so within our relationship, we have kind of these two axes that we can measure. Are we, do we care for the other person? 
And are we honest with the other person? If we do care personally, but we never challenge, she called that quadrant ruinous empathy. We show that we care about them, but we also just sit back and watch as they start to drown in their own poor choices. On the other side of the spectrum of that, if we just challenge directly, but don't demonstrate that we care for the individuals, she called that obnoxious aggression. This is what I was referring to last week when I said, we all know people that assault us with their own perspectives as self-proclaimed truth speakers right? What was interesting to find out was that when asked, oh, she went, in, in her book, she was, when she asked employees what they preferred, most employees stated that they would rather work for a competent jerk than an incompetent nice guy. That if you're going to err on one side of this spectrum, most employees said they would rather work for a competent jerk than an incompetent nice guy. People recognize the importance of honesty within relationships. Now, it may not always feel like that, but more often than not, people recognize their need for honesty. Speaking about relationships, it was actually one of the first things that drew me to my wife. I'd I'd had lots of the girlfriends through college, and most of them just kind of told me what they thought I wanted to hear. And my wife was the first person who really set me straight. And it was jarring for me at first. I'm like, I'm not sure what this is, but I think I, I don't like it, but I know I need it, right? They may not always like it, but they recognize the importance of it. Obviously, the favorable category in here is this upper right-hand quarter, what Kim Scott referred to as radical candor. This is what happens when we take the time to show people that we truly care about them, but also have the courage to be really open and honest with our feedback. This is the sweet spot. We're not withholding our honest opinion from people, but neither are we bombarding them with it like grenades thrown over a wall. I always like to present this paradigm to people that I mentor and ask them for their feedback and say like, hey, in our in our relationship with each other, like how are how are you receiving these interactions? Do you feel like I'm I'm skating? Because I I don't like if no one likes offending people, right? I don't like offending people. Sometimes I have its tendency to like err over into this side of ruinous empathy where I withhold the truth from people more than I should, right? As I'm learning to walk in the invitations of the Lord to share truth with people, sometimes, right, it takes courage, and sometimes I lack that courage, and so I withhold. So I I always like presenting this paradigm and getting active feedback from the people I'm mentoring about, like, how are we doing right now? Like, do you feel like I'm being obnoxiously aggressive, or or do you feel like I'm holding back? Like, I want to strike that line of being one of these relationships that blesses you with both care and compassion and truth. Interesting enough, as we discuss this topic of honesty and love, it's important to note that we often jump straight to the subject of how do I deliver truth to other people. Come on, pastor, I've got an earful I need to deliver to someone. Tell me how to speak the truth in love, right? It's our knee jerk when we talk about truth, is how do I deliver truth? But if we go back to 1 Corinthians 13, we see that it's not necessarily where our guiding scripture begins. What Paul seems to think is more important is how do we receive truth? Paul seems to think that before we we get to how do I speak the truth in love, we must first know how to receive the truth in love. It says love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love uh, joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Both of those phrases are referring about how do you receive the truth, not how do you give it. If you look at it again, we see that it's all actually more about receiving the truth than delivering the truth. Not that speaking truth is unimportant, but it would seem that Paul believes that it's not where we struggle most. Paul would say our primary struggle is not with with delivering the truth, but with receiving it. Not to be easily offended or defensive. Uh, think about it. When was the last time you remember joyfully celebrating the feedback you received from someone else? Right? <laughs> there's times I've received feedback better than others, but I don't know if there's ever been an instance like where I'm like, woohoo, that was great. <laughs> As I prepared for this message this morning, even I, I felt the Lord convicting me about a conversation I had a couple weeks ago. I, I just started teaching at Sand Creek High School, and, and one of the assistant principals made an appointment to come by and uh, observe one of my class periods. 
and then she made another appointment to come by and give me that feedback during a planning period. And as I was preparing for this message this morning, I realized that several times as she was providing feedback for me, I just made excuses. Like, oh, I did this because of this reason and, and, and kind of sidestep rather than just saying, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. I'll take that to heart. I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. The truth is it's hard to receive feedback from others, isn't it? It's so easy to become defensive. But what we don't realize is that in this reception of feedback is, is that we're actually setting an example. We're setting the tone for how honesty is going to play itself out in this relationship by how we receive it. James 1.19 gives us some help here. It says, My dearest brothers and sisters, take this to heart. Be quick to listen, but slow to speak. And be slow to become angry, for human anger is never a legitimate tool to promote God's righteous purpose. James says that we should listen more than we speak, or as my old mentor always used to say, Chaz, there's a reason God gave you two ears and one mouth. <laughs> The first step to receiving the truth is listening. Not only that, but listening humbly. If we're listening, truly listening humbly, then we will thank them for their honesty. It takes courage to give honest feedback. And most of the time when people withhold honesty, it is because they haven't done a great job of, we haven't done a great job of welcoming their perspective in the past. One of the ways that we can demonstrate humility and willingness to listen is by thanking them. Regardless of what is shared, you have learned something new. You always learn from others if you're willing to receive it. Tell them thank you for sharing their perspective. Thank you for trusting you enough to speak the truth. Even if their thinking and their reasoning is false or faulty, they shared what they believed was true, and that took courage. And you have learned something if at the very least you've learned what they truly think. And part of the key is being able to authentically thank them in humility. If we think too much of ourselves, we will get offended by their criticism. On the other hand, if we are insecure, we will feel shame and seek to run and hide from their feedback. Secure, secure humility allows us to receive it for what it is with gratitude because it acknowledges the fact that I am a flawed human being. But despite my flaws, I am still worthy of love and belonging. It is living in that humble tension that enables us to receive feedback without, uh, without offense, because as Charles Spurgeon once said, if any man thinks ill of you, do not become angry with him, for you are far worse than he thinks you to be. <laughs> the second way that we can receive truth by listening uh, or love receives truth by listening is by being open is openly re listens openness is akin to curiosity curiosity asks questions and seeks to understand perspectives that are different from its own not just defeat them it doesn't mean that you have to agree with what's said but openness acknowledges that it doesn't know everything and rather than immediately rejecting another perspective try to ask probing questions and seek to understand seeking to see things from their point of view. I had a young man that I mentioned, uh, mentored a few years ago, and out of the blue one day, he just paid me this, this fantastic compliment that I never, it's something that, it's like feedback that I never received before. I didn't realize this was special. We, we were talking about discussing, uh, discussing something, and I said, you know, I, I was thinking about what you said the other week, and then I, I offered him kind of like a differing perspective. I disagreed with him. And he said, stop, 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 stop. Like, do you know what I love about you? You actually listen to me and take what I say to heart. That comment that I made, that was two weeks ago, and not only did you remember what I said, you thought about it after our conversation was over. And it doesn't matter that you disagree with me, but you actually gave it space in your brain long enough to consider it, and that means a lot to me. We demonstrate to others that we value their thoughts and perspectives when we are open-minded and curious. And we demonstrate that cur curiosity by asking good questions. As John Maxwell said in his book, good leaders ask great questions. The future belongs to the curious, the ones who are not afraid to try it, to explore it, poke at it, question it, and turn it inside out. Another way that we can demonstrate openness is to seek feedback, 
to ask for it. It is one of the greatest honors and compliments that you can pay someone to ask for their perspective. And it doesn't mean you're obligated to follow their advice, but we honor others when we seek out their perspective and opinion. And you might actually find that keeping an open mind might lead to you changing your perspective. You might find that other people might just be sitting in just the right spot where they're seeing our blind spot. Have any of you ever like backed into a pole? Right? We all have blind spots. It is the nature of, of the human condition that our eyes are in the front of our heads and we can't see what's behind us. And it's helpful to find people with different perspectives from our people that see it from that point of view, right? In the age of backup cams, we feel like we're self-sufficient. <laughs> that I don't need someone to, to give me directions, but also all too often in our lives, it's helpful to have people that see things from a different point of view. They can sit in our blind spot and tell us about the things that we don't see. You might find that other people just might be sitting in that spot to see things that you don't. And openness will not only get you there, but it will give you the freedom in that moment to change your mind. There's nothing more humbling than changing your mind after a heated debate. Have you ever done this? Have you ever been right in the middle of like a huge argument and you get that sinking feeling in your stomach when you realize you're wrong? <laughs> and you've just been going gung-ho at it? No! No, this is right. And then suddenly you're like, oh. It's hard to backpedal at that point, isn't it? Versus if we've operated with openness to that point, then there's much more freedom to say, like, you know what? I think I see what you're saying. It gives us the freedom to change our mind. Just, just own up to it. It's called growth. We all have growth. We all have perspectives that can, can use some tweaking and changing. And, and if we give ourselves the freedom to change our mind and give others the freedom to change their minds. Because as George Bernard Shaw said, those who can't change their minds can't change anything. That was my second George Bernard Shaw quote in two weeks. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> so we've said, love receives truth by listening humbly, by listening openly, and the last one is by listening discerningly. You don't have to accept and believe all feedback that is given to you. But openness to it, to receive it, and wrestle with it, is important. All feedback should be filtered through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and other wise counsel. We should always be discerning, and we should expect others to be discerning of the feedback that we give. Receive it discern discerningly. When you receive feedback, stop and pray about it. Give it time. Oftentimes, it's our fast-paced uh, speed of life that we feel like a need to resolve this issue quickly. But it is okay to look at someone and say, like, you know what? That, that gives me a lot to think about. Can you give me some time to consider what you've said and, and get back to you? When you receive feedback, stop and pray about it. Ask the Lord, is there truth here? And if there is truth there, don't get so bent out of shape about the parts that aren't, right? Chew the meat, spit out the bones. If there's truth there, you can be nourished by that and be grateful for it. Ask the Lord, is there truth in this? And if there is, act on it. But don't get offended and defensive. There's another great book by John Bevere called The Bait of Satan, and it's all about offense. It's a great book. It really helps you see that offense is just one of Satan's tricks to keep us locked in a victim mentality. It gives other people responsibility for our actions and our reactions to what they say. Be discerning. If you don't agree with someone's opinion, then respectfully disagree, but don't get offended. You cannot control the way that people treat you. You cannot control what they think of you. You can't control what they say about you, but you can control the way you respond to it. This is how we show love when we receive feedback. Let your actions speak louder than their words. What about the ones, uh, what about when we're the ones sharing our perspective, though? What about when we're the ones that, that feel like the Lord is calling us to actually step into a situation and speak the truth in love? The answer to that is to think before you speak, right? This is a helpful acronym that's out there right now, but I find all of these principles are biblically based. To think before you treat, the first test of it, thinking of this is like filters, right? 
Like we all have uh, filters that we use in our daily life that kind of filter out what are the things that I'm going to say and what are the things that I'm just going to keep a lid on. And the first one is, is it true? Do I know for a fact that what I'm about to say is true? You cannot speak the truth in love if you aren't sure that it's actually the truth. This is often why, too, like why, why it's helpful when you're having a confrontation or a conflict. It's why it's helpful to actually use I statements, right? When we say things like, I think, I believe, or, or I feel, offering up these things we know as our perspective signals to the other person that we are safe to disagree with. On the other hand, when we use you statements, we often share things that just aren't true. You think, you feel, you are. You're so insensitive, right? We, we say statements that, are, that aren't true. We offer the truth in love when we make a distinction between our own perspectives and what the absolute truth is. Not only this, but we openly acknowledge that we are human beings that only see part of the full picture. This is so critical when it comes to expressing the gift of prophecy. This is why in the vineyard we say, I feel like the Lord is doing, rather than saying, thus saith the Lord. It is an act of humility and an acknowledge that it is our impression, not an exact science. And we avoid using the Lord's name in vain. When we boldly proclaim that he said something, that it's possible I missed it. The next way that we know if, uh, if you're speaking the truth is love is by asking yourself, is this helpful? Ask yourself, is what I'm thinking or sharing for my benefit or for their benefit? This can be hard to discern. I, I find for myself it's helpful to consider what the base emotion is while I'm thinking about it. While I'm thinking about this conversation I'm about to have, the truth in love is motivated by love and concern for the other person. If my core emotion in sharing this is frustration, then I'm speaking from a place of frustration and love. I'm speaking the truth out of frustration, not love and concern for the other individual. Now, that does not mean that we don't share it all together. What it probably means is you just need to wait until you cool down. Think and pray about how can I share this in a way that's calmly that is to this person's benefit and not just out of my own anger. This is always at the Holy Spirit's leading. We always say in the vineyard that we're looking for what the Father's doing and joining him in his work. But we often don't really apply that to the area of feedback, right? We, we think of like, oh, healing prayer. I look for what the Father's doing. I join him in that. But when we, when we think about my frustration with my brother, we can apply the same method. Lord, what are you doing in his life right now? I want to provide feedback that's in partnership with what you're doing and how you're transforming that individual, not bringing my own agenda to the situation. We should always prayerfully consider our feedback and ask the Lord what he's doing in the life of an individual. Sometimes the feedback is just encouragement because the Lord is saying that that's what they need right now. They don't need to be beat down with the fact that they didn't do it right. They need encouragement to actually help them keep going and keep trying. They know they blew it. You don't need to tell them that. The most helpful thing that you can do is encourage them to just keep going. Sometimes it's not the things that bug you most, but sometimes something else entirely that the Lord wants to talk about. And it's so important that we not be so arrogant that we think we know what is best for someone else. If we truly want to be helpful, then we need to prayerfully consider our word and not get ahead of the Lord or fall behind him. The next thing that we should consider if, uh, when we're considering feedback is, is this inspiring? That means, does this feedback provide a desirable way forward? Sometimes when we offer feedback, thinking of feedback as like a map, right? Our feedback can just be like this big dead-end road sign, right? I come to you and say, stop it. <laughs> and that doesn't give us a positive way forward. Could you imagine a map where you hand someone and all the different routes are X'd out? Right? Good feedback is inspiring. It provides a way forward, a positive, desirable way forward for the other person. They don't, uh, they don't encourage others to keep pursuing, the, like, the dead-end signs sometimes don't have the encouragement to keep pursuing the will of God. It just says, what you're doing, you need to stop. Good feedback will always highlight a positive way forward. 
Inspiration is an important skill to have, especially if you intend to lead others. But inspiration often starts with example. This is part of what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 7. Do you know the passage? It says, why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and fail to notice the the glaring flaws in your own? How could you say to your friend, let me show you what you're doing wrong when you're guilty even more? You're being hypocritical and a hypocrite. First acknowledge and deal with your own blind spots. Then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spots of your friend. Oftentimes, if we want to provide feedback to someone, it's important that we... It's important that when you're correcting them, you have to stop and ask, do I do this too? If so, then the the next feedback that needs to happen is is the applying of this truth to your own life before you seek to help somebody else. Your example is much more influential than your words. Don't be the person that says, do as I say, not as I do. So is this inspiring? Am I showing them with my words and my actions a positive way forward. The next thing to ask, if we want to think before we speak, is, is this necessary? Is this actually important? Is this just a little annoyance? Or is this worth talking about? It's important to ask, am I being overly sensitive? Remember, that's where Paul starts in this passage, when he says, like, the first step in truth being a part of love is actually learning how to receive it ourselves. And sometimes, in our oversensitivity, we can make a big deal about things that aren't really a big deal. Ask, is this a sin issue? Or is this just a preference issue? Even still, I generally don't offer feedback unless I have witnessed a behavior multiple times. I give people grace. We all have bad days and off moments, right? To point out a person's every misstep and mistake is unloving. Don't sweat the small stuff. Just forgive them and move on. Another aspect of deciding this is if it's necessary is asking ourselves, is this necessary right now? It can be unloving to make uh, your sense of urgency somebody else's sense of urgency. And many times, the things that we need to discuss can wait. They can wait till later. We can, we can wait to talk to them until uh, we have a moment of privacy. Again, not making them feel small includes conf- not confronting them in front of others. This is why Jesus tells us in, uh, in Matthew chapter 18, he says, if your fellow believer sins against you, you must go to them privately and attempt to resolve the matter. If he responds, then your relationship is restored. Great, it worked. But if his heart is closed to you, then go to him again. Take one or two others with you. You'll be fulfilling the scriptures teach us when it says every word will be verified by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And if he still refuses to listen, then share the issue with the congregation in hopes of restoration. I love that. Share this with the congregation in hopes of restoration because the last test to know if we're sharing the truth in love is, is it kind? Remember, kindness in in the context of love is not simply sparing people from all discomfort. It's the desire that they would experience no more discomfort than is necessary. It's the desire that we would save them from unnecessary harm or shame. One way that we do this is by choosing respectful and honoring words to use. Because in the end, love confronts, as this verse says, in hope of restoration. The entire reason we confront it all is in the hope of restoration. That the relationship would be mended and and hopefully future pain and hardship avoided. This is why it's critical to share in a way that is kind and respectful. Love does not burn bridges or simply discard relationships. It seeks a peaceful resolution. If you can't think of a respectful way to share your thoughts, then I might encourage you to find a friend with tact and ask them. Tact is the ability to punch someone in the gut and they thank you for it. (laughs) My wife has a skill, and if I have any of it at all, I've learned it from her. (laughs) It is okay to go and seek counsel as long as the purpose of the counsel is to help you seek reconciliation. After that, after you have asked yourself, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary and kind? If the words, to, if the answer to all of these is yes, then by all means, have the conversation with them. But here's the deal. 
even at that point, don't force it down their throats. Say your piece, offer your perspective, and give them some space to process. Because we circle back to the first part that we talked about, love is patient and kind. True transformation takes time. And it's probably one of the most frustrating things that they'll ever realizing is that the germination period of the seed of truth is very long. Sometimes the things that you share take years to come to fruition. And all the while we can get agitated and feel all these like, I told you so's, but when the moment finally comes, you never know. You never know if it was that original word, that was the seed that was planted three years ago that slowly grew below the surface, not breaking the ground until the day finally came where it sprouted up and actually bore some fruit. You never know the seeds that you plant when you speak the truth in love. They often take a long time to germinate. Sometimes a simple word given can take years to bear fruit, but just because it isn't immediate doesn't mean it was ineffective. I'm sure you remember the things that your parents told you that you didn't appreciate until years later, right? Truth is never wasted when it is authored in love. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is true, Lord, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword, God, that it just, it parses all of our junk. Lord, your word just weaves a line through all of our excuses, all of our bad motives, and reveals the truth to us. And God, your word also promises that the truth will set us free. That we find, freedom, we find freedom in truth, not freedom in lies. God, I pray against the work of the enemy this morning. Lord, as people are, are wrestling with uh, truth in their own life, Lord, the way that they've spoken truth or, or things that have been spoken to them, Lord, I pray that the lies of the enemy would be destroyed this morning. Lord, would your Holy Spirit be working in the minds and the hearts of every believer here, Lord, and bring about truth, a truth that leads to freedom. And Lord, would you give us courage to be truth speakers? People that say the hard things with compassion and love and humility. Would you give us that gift this morning? I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.